Terry Beswick, and I'm the Executive Director of the GLBT Historical Society. Welcome to the GLBT Historical Society Museum. I just want to welcome our esteemed panel. I'm just delighted to have you all here, and I'm excited to hear uh, what everybody has to say. And I'm going to introduce our wonderful moderator who's convened this gathering, Gerard Koskovich, who is our Senior Public History Advisor at the Historical Society and was also a founding member of the Society. Um, he was <laughs> and he's kind of my right hand too, so I really well I am my left hand. But um, he's uh, he's been um, a great uh, resource for me over the last few years. He was a freelance journalist at the time of this week. He was centrally involved with the Bad Cops No Donut queer activist group that led the three year long campaign for justice for the victims. He is now a historian, curator, and queer antiquarian book dealer. During the program, Koskovich will discuss. <coughs> okay, he'll, he'll say the rest. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all for coming this evening. We are gathered tonight to mark the 30th anniversary of the Castro Street police riot of October 6, 1989. Now, the San Francisco Police Department's response that Friday evening to a really rather small and quite peaceful act of protest against government inaction in response to the AIDS crisis remains the single largest police violation of the rights of LGBTQ people and people with AIDS in the history of our city. Now let me just introduce you briefly to our panelists who will be kicking off the conversation for us this evening. Randy Gerson, was a member of ACTUP's Local Issues Committee who helped organize the original demonstration that resulted in the Castro Sweep on October 6th. And she's currently a real estate developer in the Bay Area and is a mom to two future activists. And if they're anything like their mom, well, there's going to be hell to pay. How do I do? And uh, she'll uh, discuss ACTUP, ACTUP's objectives and planning for the protest and its reactions to the misconduct of the SFPD. Then we have Brindis Tobin, who's down at the end there. Uh, Brindis was a student and a teaching assistant uh, in the Human Sexuality Program at San Francisco State at the time, and she's now a practicing attorney. And Brindis will recount some of her stories about what she saw uh, during the March to the Castro when it got here, uh, how she was attacked and injured by a San Francisco police officer, and what happened to her subsequently that evening. Then we have Brian Brindgartner in the fabulous bow tie. <laughs> uh, Brian was an ACT UP member at the time. Uh, and he organized the group of Castro Sweep victims who sued the city for police brutality, and he also monitored quite closely the city's administrative disciplinary process for officers who were involved. For the past 23 years, he's been a prosecutor for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office, gives him an interesting point of view, and Brian will recount a bit uh, what he saw during and after the sweep and tell us a little bit about what the lawsuit against the city involved. Then finally, we have Lester Olmstead Rose, I'll go put his hand up to show you who he is. <laughs> and Lester was an organizer at the time with Community United Against Violence, uh, and his organization was involved in supporting the victims of the sweep. He's now a uh, director of strategy, strategy practice with La Piana Consulting, which is a national firm that helps nonprofits fulfill their missions. And Lester will discuss a bit the responses of QAB and other community organizations, and will comment on some of the ways the Castro Sweep relates to the evolution of relations between the SFPD and the LGBT community. And then I'll round things out by talking a little bit about, not so much about what I saw at the Sweep, although I was there, but about my research after the fact, looking for the likely causes of the Sweep. And I'll also talk just a bit about the campaign of Bad Cop No Donut to demand justice for the victims. So let's roll right ahead and hear from me. So, um, you know, as I look into the audience, the, the first thing that comes to me is um, this, a story that my daughter, who's 11, has just started um, her bar mitzvah program at Kahila. Her first day of school, the teacher said, go out to the playground and go play basketball. So the kids went out to the playground, and they were out there for, I don't know, 20 minutes, half hour, and they came back in, and the teacher said, tell me about basketball. And so all the kids started talking about the basketball game. And then she said, did everybody here play basketball? And somebody said, no. And she said, what did you do? Somebody else said, no, what did you do? And it turns out, there was a, she said, that's what history is like. People would tell the history by the, of a basketball game, but they don't tell the history of everybody that was watching the basketball game. 
and Jewish people, and I would say gay people, and black people, and brown people, our history is on the outside of the basketball game. So I really want to thank everybody for having this, and I just want to know that, say that my little memory is my memory, and there's so many people here that have other parts of this basketball game they weren't really interested to share. So I, I'm intimidated to tell my little piece, because you're all here, but I'm going to tell it the best that I can. So um, I was part of Buffalo Issues Committee, and there's several members, people here who were part of that. And we had a demonstration, living with AIDS and fighting back. So, yeah. And so I um, found it in my files. And it was just our normal, everyday act up demonstration. There was about two or 300 people. We were protesting. I'm going to read when we were protesting so that I get this right. The lack of coherent national emergency program to respond to the AIDS crisis. It was its 10th year, and there was no national emergency. Um, the Bush administration plans to concentrate spending on developing a vaccine and research and not no money available for treatment with people who already had HIV. Um, and then the world was looking at the San Francisco model as a humane response to the epidemic, yet 800 people with AIDS were living in doorways each night, and IV drug, drug users waited for months to access treatment programs, and needle exchange was not yet a reality. We also were protesting the AIDS phobic violence against the LGBT community. It was soaring. The baseball stadium had not been funded yet, and the mayor was trying to take funds from the general fund to fund the baseball stadium, and we were protesting that. So that was that's the setup that we were protesting, and we went to, the group went to the federal building to protest what the feds were doing, um, and that's where we started to see the police kind of come in. Then we started to go to City Hall, and the police, for the first time in our experience, was enforcing traffic laws. And they were forcing us about a demonstration of about two or 300 people to stay inside on the sidewalk and stop at stop signs and stop at red lights. And they were starting to cage us in. I think, um, and other people could re will remember more, um, the, the person who was the, poli the police liaison to the police went to talk to the police to say what was going on. I think he was the first person arrested. Yeah, Bill, Bill Haskell. Yes, Bill Haskell was the first person arrested. And so we knew right then that there was something really, something was going on that was bigger in our demonstration. So, but we kept going. We, were, we, went, to the city, we went to City Hall. Um, we went to the Mint, um, where we had another demonstration where the Hiss Caucus spoke. Um, and the police were really, really, it was starting to get worse. The police started to get cold and darker, and the police were hemming us into the sidewalk. Like, you know, a little 10 foot sidewalk with 200 people, 200, 300 people. Um, and I remember people were starting to get like agitated because we were just trying to do our demonstration. And it was around, the, I think it was around where the LGBT center is now. We stopped and we regrouped ourselves. Um, and we said, let's just focus on the, what we're here for. Let's just focus on these issues. Um, we're, we were trying to be peaceful. We were peaceful. And we were just trying to get our message across. Um, but at that, that, you know, so we came up, I remember coming up to Market Street and I remember seeing all the red lights because it was starting to get dark. And so I saw, remember seeing the red lights of the cops in the Castro at that time. And it was, obviously out of control and it wasn't about our demonstration anymore, it was about something different. Um, they kept yelling, please obey the traffic laws, please obey the traffic laws. Um, um, we, we got to the Castro and there was you know, police and riot gear here. We were just trying to, we usually took over Market and Castro Street and did a, a quilt and the spray paint of the quilt, but they wouldn't let us get there. So what we did is we took over Castro Street and we put, did the quilt there. Um, by that time, um, the police were really out of control, and the demonstration had gotten bigger. And we were, you know, I remember that I couldn't get arrested, and this is, you know, part of my story that night. I couldn't get arrested because initially um, we had a plan that we were going to do an action against the Chronicle called the Chronic Riot, and we had um, read it took one week of the Chronicle stories around people with AIDS, HIV, or gay, and we corrected them. And so we had we had this already written. And we had a group of people that were going to go out and put this in the newspaper box that night. Um, so I knew I couldn't get arrested that night because I had a, a different message that I had to put out. And so the group of people that were planning this um, stayed. We, we took notes and we watched it. And then we ended up putting together this, this long story, which is how I remember everything that happened that night. <laughs> um, and we went out that So we wrote this. A bunch of us wrote this. Um, and then um, all the people that were planning to go into the, put this in the Chronicle boxes came over to my house. 
and we went out early in the morning, we separated into different cars, and we went into the carnival boxes, and we actually told the story as it really happened, not the way this carnival story. So, um, and then from there on, the issue became, and I'll, I'll pass it on, but the issue became something different than what we were trying to talk about in terms of the Bill of Rights. since I'm the one with the microphone, right? <laughs> works out. Uh, so when we got to the Castro, that was, you know, at first that feeling of, oh God, we're almost home, you know, when we got there and the police presence was so extreme and so over the top. And it was a Friday night, you know, so you think about what the Castro is like when there isn't, how busy the Castro is on a Friday night when there isn't a demonstration. <laughs> Right, so imagine in the middle of your commute hours on a Friday night, all of this happens on top of everything. And I think one of the things Randy was talking about that was very important was the focus on being peaceful. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, we were both sort of lucky and cursed by our determination to keep things from getting completely more out of hand than they ended up getting because one of the first things that, that, you know, that happened was the police, eventually we had a, a line of police in riot gear, a yard from, I'm sure some of you remember this, um, but there was a line of police in riot gear about a yard from the curb right there where the muni station was. And I grabbed a couple of other people and just tried to form a line on the curb because people were coming up, they were letting people out of the Muni station but not in. And so people were coming out, they were coming home from work, they were going out, they were trying to get places. And they're like, oh, well, a demonstration is always a demonstration. It's nothing to do with me. And they would try and step off into the street and whack, off they go to the paddy wagon. <laughs> it did not go well for a lot of people. So we tried to form a line there on the curb. And at some point, Captain Richard Carnes decided that we had apparently not been violent enough. And I, I, I don't know, but I suspect that there was a problem because there was this enormous overwhelming response and yet we hadn't actually done anything to justify it. And so Captain Carnes was walking in the yard wide space between the line of, riot, of police and riot gear and those of us on the curb doing martial arts moves with his baton and snapping it in people's faces. <laughs> and you know, doing this and trying to get people to react. He was trying to provoke the riot that they were supposedly there to stop. You know, and it wasn't working. It wasn't working. And so eventually I think he just got frustrated. Eventually, the pressure behind us became such that I got pushed forward. I didn't want to fall into the police officers in front of me. I reached my hand out like this to grab the person next to me, and I got a police billy club across the back of my hand. That hurt. Ow. I was not happy. I did manage to catch the badge number, the officer. Um, I was raised by an <laughs> um, so I had been watching my digital watch and noting the times and trying to get badge numbers and all of that. Shortly after he hit me, that same officer then split up and stole his head. Um, at that point, I decided that it was absolutely critical that I not be the only person who knew this guy's badge number. That was, that was, that had to happen. Because, you know, Captain Carnes was standing over him and uh, he was bleeding and people were trying to get to him to help him. And every time, so 
somebody did, he'd uh, strike at them. And I was like, okay, this is, we have to, we have to, I can't be the only person who knows this guy's badge number, but I'm really bad at remembering numbers. I'm just catastrophically, horribly bad at it. However bad you think you are, I am worse. But what I can do, I can make up annoying rhymes. <laughs> thereafter, there was a very large circle of people around Captain Carnes yelling, shame, shame, shame on you, badge number 1942, shame, shame, shame on you, badge number 1942. So a lot of people knew this badge number. So I can't imagine how that happened. But I do know that's how I got arrested. Um, <laughs> because eventually a bunch of police came and they actually took him away because he was standing over Michael and we went in and not letting, and there was, a, there was an ambulance sitting right there. I remember, it was like just flashing flashes. I remember sit, standing there, looking at the blood and looking at the ambulance and looking at the officer who was preventing anybody from rendering aid to this person who was seriously injured. And you know, as a technical note, Captain Carnes did, in fact, raise his baton over his shoulder level, which was prohibited after the Dolores Huerta incident. For those of you who aren't old enough to remember, this is a the shoulder level thing is, is critical. Anyway, he eventually came back, pointed to me, and said, and told some other officers, that's an arrest. And they were like, okay. So they take me away and they ask, what am I getting arrested for? And they're like, I don't know. Um, <laughs> so we got in the paddy wagon and we, a bunch of us got taken off the 850 Bryant, including some poor guy who had just stepped out of his apartment to move his car. He was wearing flip flops and whatever he'd fallen asleep in front of the TV in. And they were marching shoulder to shoulder down Castro Street, arresting everyone they could get their hands on. They wouldn't let him go back into his apartment. He had no idea what was going on, poor guy. Um, there was one other woman in the paddy wagon with me, and the guys in the back said, okay, I can't believe this, I can't believe this is happening. I'm like, what, what, what? Because I couldn't see. And they apparently, a bunch of officers waded into the middle of a crowd, grabbed the one obviously black woman, like, in a 14 block radius, and dragged her out and put her in the paddy wagon with me. We got to 850 Bryant, and some of the people got let out of the paddy wagon, and the rest of us they drove away with. That was very nervous making. That was the point at which I thought I was going to die. Um, and we drove around for a while. Where we actually ended up was the tact tactical squad office. I didn't know where we were when they let us out and changed us to the bench and you know put us on the bench there. And they're running around watching themselves on television, eating pizza, drinking soda. And I was still very curious as to why I had in fact been arrested. And so I finally, they said they were gonna cite us and release us. And so I looked at the code, I had no idea what the code meant. I said, what, what have I been arrested for? And the officer looked at me and said, felonious assault on a police officer. And I burst out laughing, I was so relieved. So I knew they were never gonna make that stick. <laughs> 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 so, but then they also asked, Has any, was anybody injured? People said, yes, you know, I got some bruises, I got hurt, I got this, I got that. And I said, yes, I received a serious injury to my right hand, which you will notice is extremely swollen. When I was improperly struck by a police officer, the badge number 1942, you should take pictures. They were not very happy with me. <laughs> uh, they lost the pictures, too. Um, after all that, and they kept me late to take the pictures. So I was the last person released. Um, Rachel Lederman almost got arrested, one of the attorneys almost got arrested herself trying to find me because everyone had seen me get arrested, but then I wasn't with everybody else. And one of the guys who'd been in the wagon with us actually stood on that cold, windy street corner until they let me out. Tell Calvin. Yes. Mm. Yeah, yeah, he was unfortunately up too far away, couldn't hear me. But he waited for me on that corner so that there was somebody there when I got out. 
So I was a member of ACT UP, and I started at the Federal Building and was shocked by the police presence for what we all thought was going to be another uh -huh. march that people actually were complaining about, which is going to be this boring thing. And things progressed, as Randy's already explained. And by the time we got to the Castro, I was practically running to get there because I thought, once we're there, we'll be safe. They won't dare do anything us, to us there. That's our community, our neighborhood. Our brethren will be there, we'll be protected. They won't dare do anything. Uh, and people uh, sat down in the middle of Castro Street, stopped traffic. Um, and were methodically arrested. Those were the hardcore ACT UP people who had wanted to be arrested. Uh, but then the police announced that not only did people have to clear the street, they also had to clear the sidewalk. I thought that was very strange. I was standing on the retaining wall uh, that's right at Castro and Market, right above the Mimi station, and I figured, since I wasn't on the sidewalk, I didn't have to leave. <laughs> this was long before I even thought of going to law school. Already, already thinking that way, right? So I stood there as people actually did leave, and I saw from that vantage point Michael Barnett getting hit over the head with a police baton. I didn't know who he was, but I, I didn't know him at all. But I saw it happen, and I heard the noise, and from what I remember, the entire crowd gasped in reaction to it, to both the it happening and the noise it made when it hit his skull, the very hollow noise it made. And the way I remember it is, everyone around them sort of took a half a step back, and all of a sudden there was more of an opening in space around him. Uh, but eventually as things progressed, a police officer walked up to me and said, son, if you don't get down from there, you're going to get arrested. In, in a very nice, non-threatening way. And so I did get down. I walked through Harvey McPlaza to Collingwood Street, walked on, down Collingwood to 18th, walked down 18th back to Castro. By the time I got there, uh, I ran into TJ Anthony at the corner of 18th and Castro, who was at a payphone back when we had those. <laughs> and um, he was... Uh, trying to reach Judge Mary Morgan on the phone. Now, I didn't know Mary Morgan, um, and I didn't really understand how calling a judge was going to help anything, but he was trying to call her, and he kept saying to me, more quarters, more quarters. So I was thinking, <laughs> all the change I had. Meanwhile, the police are coming down Castro Street, and I'm thinking, I've got to get out of here. So I turned and left him there, trying to reach Mary Morgan on the phone. I don't know if he ever reached her, or how he even had her phone number. But um, I'm heading down then uh, Castro Street towards 19th. I ran into my friend James Dye, and I heard what I thought were police running up behind us, and I got very scared, and so I grabbed him and we ducked into the patio restaurant. And someone who worked there locked the door behind us and said, that's it, no one else is coming in here. And at that point, um, the police were marched all the way down Castro to 19th Street, cleared it from building line to building line. That was literally the sweep, where they made everyone get out off of the sidewalk and into homes and businesses and so forth. They then made announcements that we had to stay off the sidewalk, stay inside the businesses and homes, and said, um, police are authorized to use force. Well, I had seen how violently they had arrested people along our way from the federal building. They didn't just give people citations or put them in handcuffs. They were throwing people to the ground for jaywalking. It was horrible. And they had never treated us like this before, protest. Um, so I stayed in there. I was in there for about 20 to 30 minutes when the police finally retreated. They didn't leave the area, but they went back towards Market Street. The problem that the police had that night was they didn't have an end game. Mm -hmm. They didn't know what they were going to do after they told us we had to clear the whole area. Well, it's like, okay, well, then what? So when they finally let us come out, everyone came out, and of course, we immediately went into the street. <laughs> <laughs> so the police had to come back and clear the street again, and then we all you know, went back onto the sidewalk. Then they left. We got back on the street again. So there was this cat and mouse thing that went oh, back and forth a couple of times. And finally, the police just left in toto, and we... Um, all went into the street at that point and were dancing and jumping up and down and singing and chanting and so forth. And at that point, I looked at my watch and decided I wanted to get home in time to watch the news. <laughs> Back then, if you didn't catch it when it was broadcast, you missed it. So I ran home to watch all the news coverage and try to tape it on a, a VCR. So one of the things I decided that night was um, I wasn't going to let the police get away with this. I 
kind of made a vow of, look, I can't stop you people from doing this, but this is absolutely horrific, and I'm going to make sure that something happens. And I really didn't know how to do that, but I wrote letters the next day to every individual person on the Board of Supervisors. I uh, filed a complaint with the Office of Citizen Complaints, which is now the Department of Police Accountability. And um, eventually, I decided uh, I was gonna file a lawsuit. So um, I rented a P.O. box, I rented a phone number that went straight to voicemail that was very inexpensive, and I wrote letters to the editor of the local papers and said, if you were involved that night and wanted to join this lawsuit, contact me. And I got in touch with a man named Dennis Cunningham who had been representing activists who was still kicking. I thought he was elderly then. He is still, he is still prosecuting the federal government over the way prisoners are treated. God bless him. And so he agreed to take on the case. And um, we had about 20 of us, and it was a mix of people who uh, were members of ACT UP and people who just happened to be caught in the neighborhood at that time. And uh, that progressed, we filed the complaint, there were depositions that progressed in the, the course of civil, uh, the way a civil lawsuit does. And at the same time, I started going to police commission meetings just to kind of figure out, well, what's the administrative side of this and how can we get the city to, to discipline the officers? Um, initially, there was a huge uh, public outcry about this and the press gave it a lot of attention. It was a huge, huge media story and the mayor was being pressured and was very concerned, and the chief of police was very concerned about it. But what happened on October 17th, just a week and a half later, was a major earthquake. That knocked the story, not just off the front page, but out of the news completely. So there was a small period of momentum, and I always would, would love to know, like if there hadn't been that earthquake, what would have happened? But, but the public no longer cared about it, the media no longer cared about it, it was no longer in the public eye. But um, through about two years plus of going to the police commission every Wednesday night, they finally had an administrative hearing against uh, Captain Richard Carnes. Brindis testified, other people testified who had seen what was ha happened. The problem was the person who was the prosecutor for that administrative hearing was a police officer. He was a police officer in the administrative affairs unit, the internal investigations unit of the police department. I can't remember his name, but he had no, he didn't care what happened. He was just doing his job and collecting a paycheck. He had no, no personal, he wasn't emotionally involved in it at all. And uh, the police commission eventually made a finding, not that Captain Carnes had hit Michael Barnett. They did not find that that happened, even though people testified about it, including Michael Barnett, who, who very emotional testimony, where at one point he said, someone asked him a question, he said, I couldn't see what was happening. I had blood in my eyes. But um, in any event, they did find him, the way I remember it, that he had uh, filed a false police report, the report against Brindis. And that's what they eventually um, disciplined him for. And they gave him a 90-day suspension, 90 days without pay, which was the most severe discipline they could give him short of firing. Of course, he should have been fired. but. We got something out of it. There was one other hearing that took place after I moved to Portland to go to law school, and that was the officer who hit Eric Wilcox in the mouth with a baton. I don't believe he was disciplined, and Eric had to go through that all alone, because at that point, everyone had forgotten about the case. Um, the civil lawsuit settled when we were just about to start picking a jury, and I was living in Portland at the time, uh, for about $200,000, and we had to split that with the attorneys, and then we had to split it um, among the plaintiffs, uh, depending on how people had been involved in it. So um, that was pretty much how that ended, but I have to say the event was one of the reasons, really, the main reason I ended up going to law school. And when I applied to law school and had to write an essay about why I wanted to be a lawyer, I wrote an essay about what I experienced that night. And so, at least for me, some good came out of it. Um, so, uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces here tonight. A lot of you, I don't know your names, but I do recognize your faces from many, many ACT UP meetings. Uh, thank you. Thanks. So <clears throat> I was not there, uh, and I had forgot the first play the first time I knew it was happening until Brian said he went home to watch it on TV because I saw it on TV news that night. Like, oh my God, this is happening. Um, and uh, so Community United Against Violence, the a lot of you know, 
um, but the younger people in the room may not. Um, it, it, the organizations straddle worlds in a sense. We worked with and for the community, um, but we were seen as a little bit institutional, like a lot of people in ACT UP wouldn't trust, didn't trust COOP, um, and yet the day, because we would work with the police, and we often work with the police, um, but our primary responsibility was to the community. So in, in the aftermath, we had scores of reports. So we, uh, one of the primary functions of the organization was to take reports of violence against LGBT people, um, uh, to, to be a witness to it in a sense, and then to help, help victims of violence. And so we took scores of reports um, but more, uh, more directly, where we went with that was to think about what do you do about this? So if this happened, what do you do? Um, and I uh, have been thinking about it since, and um, I, I'm, he's gonna be mad at me, but I do wanna introduce John Crew back in the corner, who was uh, the ACLU police accountability lawyer, something like that at the time. Um, and he was the hub for a long time around police issues in San Francisco. Um, and we had been working with the ACLU for a while. Um, and after that event, uh, when I was thinking about it leading up to tonight, I, I think of it as almost futile, like not that much came out of it, really. When I think of accountability, you know, 90 days for Captain Carnes, Frank Jordan, who probably didn't have anything to do with it, um, was clueless and went on to be mayor. Um, nice guy, but a clueless mayor, too. Um, um, uh, I was reading an article, uh, Deputy Chief Frank Reed, who almost certainly knew all about it, not much happened with him. Um, you know, so it, it, it has felt futile. John Crew reminded me, and I appreciate this um, with some context that the historians in the room maybe uh, can flesh out better than I can, but if you look at this in the context of, for, in, the way I think of it is the White Knight Riots, think of it in terms of the Dolores Huerta attack, which was mentioned earlier um, in Union Square, where she nearly was killed by a police baton. Um, and then you think about the Castro sweep. When you put it in context, um, uh, what it did lead to at that time, actually I'll say one more thing. Brian was right. I distinctly recall a week and a half of, this was the center of San Francisco, and it just, disappear. Um, I went back uh, to read articles, the VAR right afterwards, main story all over the place. The next week was two days after the earthquake. There's a good story from Dennis Conkin, uh, still around living in the Civic Center, um, typewritten because it was written, they lost their power in the earthquake and they typewritten the story um, and published it. And the following week there was one picture about a follow-up meeting. So by three weeks later, just kind of disappeared as an issue. Um, however, it did set in motion kind of the slow wheels of bureaucracy and process, um, and a number of groups, organizations, individuals, uh, I, I believe that that was the catalyst to really look at reforming crowd control policy, and here's where John's uh, memory helps me. And so over a period of time, actually, there was a significant rewriting of crowd control policy, um, which I wouldn't know this firsthand. John says ultimately became the national model and still is where people look to it. Um, so maybe my pessimistic view of very little coming out of it, um, in, in the way we would like it to come out of and people being held accountable, uh, maybe my pessimistic view needs to be a little brighter in that some of the institutional change maybe has happened. Um, there might have been some small steps forward. So. What I'd like to do is indeed follow up on what Lester was talking about a bit, and that's place the Castro sweep in a broader historical context. And first, for the people who weren't there, I probably should say briefly that when we talk about the sweep, what happened was more than half of the police officers on duty that evening invaded the Castro, shut down seven blocks of the neighborhood for up to three hours, forcing people to stay locked in their homes and businesses, including a full house at the Castro Theater, where they were locked in there for two and a half hours. Uh, they essentially declared martial law, which local police don't have the authority to do, and invaded the most famous gay neighborhood in the world in the darkest years of the AIDS crisis. It was really shocking. 
And if we look back a little bit, we can think why it was doubly shocking in that the, the Castro sweep took place almost a quarter century after queer activists managed to force the SFPD to stop routinely raiding gay and lesbian bars. Four years before Stonewall, we put an end to bar raids in this city, largely. It took place 23 years after the riot at Compton's Cafeteria, which was in response to police harassment of transgender women and queer street youth. It took place 10 years after the White Night Riot, when queers busted out windows and burned police cars at City Hall in response to the slap on the wrist given to the former SFPD officer who murdered Harvey Milk and George Moscone. And it took place at a point when the LGBT community had been pushed to the brink by the AIDS crisis with thousands of our loved ones dead already and many thousands more struggling with the disease at that time. And finally, it took place, as a couple of other folks have mentioned, in a period when, for at least a couple of years, the SFPD had not previously cracked down on these kinds of protests and had never cracked down in this way on an AIDS-related protest. Uh, and the State Department generally sent a small number of officers to facilitate the march and make sure nobody got run over and just move things along, and it was efficient and peaceful and no problem. So all of that meant that we were well aware of the SFPD's long history of anti-LGBTQ behavior, but we also had reason to think that the act of protest on the evening of October 6, 1989 would involve little more than an uneventful march from Civic Center to the Castro. In fact, it was such a small protest, it just looked like it was gonna be a big dud, but we were doing our duty as part of a national day of action declared by ACT NOW, the coalition of ACT UPs around the country. And so, uh, as we heard, what happened was the exact opposite of an uneventful <laughs> protest. Uh, the SFPD dogged this small march from the first minute. Uh, there were as many police officers as there were protesters. One cop per protester. That's inventive. That's a new one. Uh, the first person to be arrested would act up as police liaison who tried to maintain some kind of cordial communication between, between the two sides. Uh, and when we got to the Castro, Already at the corner of Martin and Castro Street, it was about 7.30 p.m., it was dark, there were more police officers massed than I had ever seen in my entire life there waiting for us to get to our neighborhood. Uh, so uh, those police actions, as I say, were shocking on their face, but we were doubly shocked because we truly did not expect anything like this to happen. So for me, one of the things that, that I asked myself right at the time was, how can we explain this insane overreaction? And after the fact, the SFPD itself tried to come up with justifications, uh, but none of them stood up to critical examination. I'll give you just a couple of examples, and you'll note the Trumpian brilliance of the SFPD's thinking. So first, the SFPD claimed that protesters had thrown rocks and bottles at the police police folks, folklore, that's why my drag name is Roxanne Bottles. <laughs> but this claim didn't hold up because the department's own after action report written the next day by the commanders of the event said that the only instance of an object being thrown at the police was after this phalanx of cops began sweeping the neighborhood and kicking everybody out of the Castro. So it's rather difficult that something happened that happened after the sweep started caused the sweep. Uh, there's a time warp in the mind of the SFPD. Uh, similarly, the SFPD subsequently tried floating a new excuse, claiming that during this national day of action on October 6th, demonstrators from Act Up Los Angeles in LA earlier that afternoon had engaged in violence against the police and that caused the SFPD command staff to worry that violence was going to happen here and that as a result, they changed their plans for the protest at the last minute. The original plan was to send 24 cops and facilitate things. Uh, and so they had to instead contain this violent folk protest at all costs. The only problem was the protest in Los Angeles happened after the police crackdown started <laughs> in San Francisco. So again, the cause and effect relationship in the mind of the SFPD is, shall we say, 
rather scrambled. Uh, clearly, the SFPD, if you'll pardon my saying so, are incapable of keeping their story straight, or everything else is straight. Now, by comparison, how did San Francisco AIDS activists and people in the neighborhood explain the sweep at the time? And what I heard repeatedly starting that very night from activists was that the SFPD had been held back from punishing increasingly uppity AIDS activists who in the previous year had gotten away with holding a sit-in on the Golden Gate Bridge at rush hour in the morning, locking up traffic throughout the Bay Area for hours, and then with disrupting the uh, festive opening night of the opera season, uh, much to the annoyance of lots of rich people. Uh, and that what's more, and here's the really good one, that during the political funeral of Terry Sutton, one of the founders of Act Up San Francisco, six months before the sweep here in the Castro, a dauntless gang of Act Up protesters had not only taken over Castro Street to hold the funeral, but had succeeded in chasing the SFPD out of the neighborhood. Now, I was a journalist at the time, and I was a trained historian, and I thought that this sounded like, well, like activist folklore. <laughs> and that yeah, it just seemed like a, a bit of a story. But that the argument was, given the first opportunity, this was the first act of protest in the Castro since that Terry Sutton uh, political funeral, that the SFPD had taken an opportunity to, in, in exact revenge, on these uppity queer and AIDS activists, uh, that it was a chance for the department old guard to relive the good old days of their youth 25 years before when slapping queers around had been a fringe benefit of employment as a cop. And indeed, the command staff of the SFPD at that point all dated back to when slapping queers around was a fringe benefit of being a cop in this town. Uh, it wasn't history to them, it was the good old days. Uh, so the, the story that the SFPD had been run out of the Castro sounded to me like, wish, like activist wishful thinking or exaggeration, but I thought like a journalist and a historian, so I filed a Public Records Act request with the SFPD, and much to my surprise, the official after action report written about that Terry Sutton political funeral, uh, the commander of the event himself wrote, that there were so many activists and they were so upset that he feared that the 24 officers on hand would, would of men, doesn't know how to write either, outflanked, and so they were forced to leave the neighborhood. The SFPD's own after action report said they had to retreat in the face of the activists, so that story certainly was true. Uh, and here's the capper. Who was the event commander for the SFPD at that political funeral? the very same officer who came back as the event commander for the Castro Suite. Same cop was in charge of both things. Uh, so I was forced to conclude that that was a reasonable explanation, that the, the SFPD had had it up to here with these out of control queers, and a bunch of those cops had a personal motive for revenge, and that that's why they invaded the Castro, that they had no reason to do it in terms of legitimate police control of the protest, uh, or of some sort of violence by the protesters, it was revenge, pure and simple, and it was a fiesta of good old cop queer hating that they hadn't been able to do for years and years. Uh, so I, I find that to be not only a plausible explanation, but having looked at this in depth for years, the only plausible explanation. Uh, so uh, uh, a very vivid moment for us uh, here in San Francisco. So how did we, as a community, respond to the sweep? The following night, there was a march through the Castro that was five times as big as the protest the night before. I remember two young men, a young white guy in his early 20s and a young man of color carrying a big bed sheet on which they had painted, the Castro is ours. A reassertion that this is our place and we decide how these streets are run and what they mean, not the SFPD. Uh, and we went on to hold a series of informal protest actions. A small group of us, including Brian, got together and kind of agreed, well, we don't want ACT UP, be, Act up to be distracted from its real work, which is battling the AIDS crisis. Uh, so we got together and said, we'll take care of battling the cops and demanding justice. We took this informal group uh, that came to be known as Bad Cop No Donut uh, and uh, mounted a series of protests lobbying the police commission and so on throughout the full three years that the lawsuits and police disciplinary proceedings continued. 
and perhaps most spectacularly, we organized an annual permit-free street party to take over the Castro on the anniversary of the sweep to remind the cops, uh, no, we run this neighborhood. We decide whether the street is open or closed, not the SFPD. Uh, and these were fabulously queer events with a thousand or more people in attendance every time. There were comedians, there were singers, there was street theater. One year we did a projection of gigantic slides on the front of the building above Walgreens and there were go-go boys and go-go girls up there dancing to the theme of Hawaii Five-O, that 70s pop show. <laughs> and uh, a particularly lovely one the first year was, the second year was that we held a, a sporting event to award a prize to the person who was capable of rolling a flaming glazed donut the farthest down Castro Street. <laughs> <laughs> and so let me, let me close just by returning to my assertion that the Castro Street was the largest single violation of the rights of LGBTQ people and people with AIDS by the police in the history of San Francisco. And the reason I say that is we can look back and think, what was the largest raid on a gay bar? There was a raid in 1961 at the Taybush Inn where 103 people were arrested. Almost that many people were arrested at the Castro Suite, but more importantly, the entire neighborhood was put under arrest for three hours. Thousands of people were illegally arrested by the SFPD. When the, when the SFPD invaded the Castro after the White Knight Riot, they came up here to enact revenge, they sent 24 officers who busted up the elephant walk and beat up a few people, it was nasty. They sent nearly 10 times as many officers to invade the Castro during the Castro sweep. Uh, so the police abuse that was represented by that sweep far exceeds those earlier events. The one thing in my mind links all of them, or perhaps two things. The victims received little justice across a period of more than 30 years that I've just been talking about. The SFPD acted just however it pleased towards queer people, and our city's leaders were too timid to do anything about it, or perhaps approved of it. The other thing that was true through all of that is we never gave up. We didn't agree to be abused. We maintained our dignity, and we're doing that here tonight by making sure that this injustice is never forgotten. Thank you all. <laughs> Think about police violence that happened to LGBT people 30 years ago without thinking about what police violence is doing to black and brown people every day since then. I just want to sort of put that out there. I don't have a, a solution for that, but I just want to acknowledge that that exists and this is part of that. Is everything being shocking? The word we haven't used that to me re continues to be the most shocking thing about it is the word to keep in mind is premeditated. Mm -hmm. This was a premeditated attack on the neighborhood. And there's no way to interpret anything that happened that night, thinking that it was one event led to the other, led to the other, and it was a big mistake. It was premeditated. And to a certain extent, it's a reiteration, and especially in the face of the obvious premeditation, had we not been fairly darn nonviolent, especially under the circumstances, the consequences could have been catastrophic for a huge number of people that night because they were clearly <coughs> looking to wrap things up. And so I think we were very lucky in a lot of ways that we were able to maintain that line and that people didn't lose their tempers and start physically battling with the police officers because at that point, it, I do not believe it would have gone well. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say was when they announced that this officer was being suspended for 90 days, it was improper use of force to me, improper use of force for another woman, um, failure to fill out a use of force log, <laughs> <laughs> um, in, and uh, wrongful arrest and imprisonment of myself and another woman. So the two people this big martial arts guy arrested were myself and JD, <laughs> just FYI. But when they made the announcement that they were suspended,
suspending him for 90 days, I didn't realize that this was the most you know, heavy-handed punishment that had been handed out since he was like 1850 or something. It was like the worst thing that had happened to a police officer, you know, in a case where no one died. But this was like the worst thing that had happened since you know, the 1800s. I did not know this. I did not know this, but I was so angry when I found out he wasn't going to be fired. I got up and I walked out. And I just remember the look of complete shock on the police commission, on Commissioner Kecker's face. Because here he managed to get the most serious punishment anyone could possibly imagine. And I was so angry, I'm like, I'm going to get arrested again if I don't leave right now. <laughs> and I got up and I walked out, and several people walked out with me. I was very hurt. I was on painkillers, my right arm was in a splint. Um, and I was really out of it for a while there. And the community was incredibly supportive and helpful. And one of the things that I was really, really proud of, and still to this day, I'm very proud of, is the way people did try to stay in touch. And you know, in, in the time we didn't, we didn't have a Facebook group, we didn't all have cell phones, we didn't all have phones. <laughs> you know? And we tried. We really did, and I think that there's a lot to be said for that. I, mean, I think that's something that shouldn't be forgotten. You know, we were not 100% successful by any stretch of the imagination, but we really did try to support each other and be there for each other and to find other people who were impacted by that event and to lift them up and help them be part of some of the, like when we took over the mayor's, on that top no donuts took over the mayor's office and they stole our donuts. You know, we, you know, we, we try to bring people in, and I think it was important. Indeed, and I'll add just a couple of things. One is that we've been hearing about Captain Carnes, who, who engaged in all of this violence. Another thing that's utterly shocking about this event is that Captain Carnes was the tactical commander for the event. He was the second in command supposed to be in charge of ensuring the discipline of the force and he was the first officer to break ranks and start beating people up. So I think he sort of told his force, okay, everybody, follow the boss. Uh, he was a very brutal, sinister man. Uh, we had a lot of unfortunate dealings with him. We ended up, I ended up filing a second complaint against him because he tried to intimidate us during the police commission hearings, um, and they had to interview him, and the OCC said they couldn't really decide one way or the other, but I, I filed a second complaint just to let him know that he wasn't going to intimidate me, so. Indeed, so uh, and I, I also want to take a, a brief moment to honor the memory of the people that we lost uh, for the fifth anniversary of the sweep, at which point effective treatment for HIV AIDS had not yet arrived, we were still in the darkest years of the crisis. We put together a list and managed to identify 12 of the activists who were involved in this event who had died of AIDS in those five years. We were out there protesting because we were fighting for our lives, and this is how the SFPD reacted. One other little story, the meeting afterwards, a private meeting at Mayor Art Agnes's office, the next morning, Saturday after the sweep, there were a dozen of us there, and Art Agnes explained to us, oh, you just have to wait because it's gonna take a while for there to be culture change in the police department because all these old guys who've been there ever since, since it was all run by working class Irish and Italian Catholics and it's just hard to get them to change their minds. It was shocking. And I said to him, well, Mr. Mayor, I can understand why you're too cowardly to take this on. The last mayor who tried to reform the police department was murdered by an ex-cop. And Agnos just sat there with his jaw on the table. And didn't have anything else to say. I'm like, we don't have the time to wait, Mr. Mayor. Maybe you do. Uh, it was quite an interesting moment. I wasn't there really <laughs> That's why you don't want to have a historian in the room. <laughs> so let's turn it over now to, to comments and questions from the audience. And let me urge people, if you're going to tell us a story, keep it pretty short, because I bet there are a lot of really good ones. Do we want to try to have the mic go around or have people come up? I don't know. I can boom out. Okay, boom out. So what happened to Kern's career, though? Did he go on to illustriousness or what? He was in the middle of the heat of game. John? Yeah, the short version is he would have been on a career arc 
to end up in the top level of the command staff. Very well could have been the chief of police at some other town. But thanks to these people and lots of other organizers to push back, he ended up as the private security guard for Barry Bonds when Barry Bonds was under arrest being prosecuted in the steroid scandal. <laughs> that was the arc of Captain Carnes' career, to be a private security guard and embarrassed running around with Barry Bonds. So how was he involved? Thank you for all of How was he involved in Frida Gage? Justice comes in different ways. But how, yeah. how did he get pushed out? What he retired. He, he retired. 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 But that that suspension so ended the path that he was going to end up as chief here or in some other town. Yeah. He was captain retired while station for a while. Right. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. But his career stalled, and as soon as he could collect his full retirement paycheck, he scampered off to do other things, including becoming a promoter for boxing matches. You can find a YouTube video of him talking about that. <laughs> um, yes. Um, this actually was brought up, uh, triggered a memory in me that it has nothing to do with the Swede. Why don't you stand up? Okay. Um, my father was um, gay and out in Southern California in the uh, 1930s and 40s. And he was arrested in 1940 in an LAPD sting operation along with hundreds of gay men. And um, I had heard this story from my father from 1975 on when he came out to me. And the police officer, when it finally broke open, um, the LA Times broke it open, which was amazing. And um, when I, I found the article, and it said that um, the police officer was suspended for th uh, 90 days. <laughs> and all my life, since then, I thought, you know, of course, I, I just thought that is the most horrible thing. He ruined all these men's life. My father dropped out of school. He, knew he could never be a school teacher. He changed his name to get into the oh, army. Gosh. The Navy wouldn't let him get in with the arrest on his record. And um, so maybe I should reframe that a little bit and say maybe that was a really big deal back in 1940 that he was suspended for 90 days. But it wasn't justice. It definitely wasn't. So Other questions and comments? I was reading in the paper about the current police chief and how he brings his apology to the gay community regarding police violence. It seems like he's trivializing it. He doesn't even think it's serious. He didn't even respond to the mayor about what he was proclaiming over his live church. I find this man totally needs to take more serious about the history of his violence and peaceness to the police chief. I helped plan that event, so if you want to learn more about it, you can talk to me later. And also, the, peace, the, the, uh, the mayor should be involved. Our mayor has been involved, of course, she's a lesbian, and we have an African American female police chief in Seattle, Washington, and they've had an open proclamation regarding gay pride about the peace violence in Seattle, and it was a proclamation for the city itself. I'll, I'll jump in thinking, as both an activist and a historian say, I don't want an apology, I want reparations. Where's the money? <laughs> there should be a sack of cash handed over to the historical society to oversee historians documenting the violence the SFPD has yes. brought against our community, our intersectional intersection, community with trans folk and people of color and women who've been victims of the SFPD. I want the SFPD to open its historical records, which are still closed. Yes. You can't get access to them. Mm -hmm. uh, there are real things they could do. An apology is just a lot of double talk unless it's attached to action, and there are real actions that could be taken. Uh, that's what I'd like to see. Uh, save your apologies, uh, uh, write a check, and uh, change your policy about access to the historical record. Laura, do you have a question? Um, honestly, I was going to ask about the apology as well. Uh, it, it, you know, because, so this was a, um, after some, some effort calling on the SFPE to apologize, starting with Compton's Cafeteria, but uh, White Knight, but they explicitly included October 6th as one of the things wow. they were asking for an apology from the SFPD. And there was this event that Clyde or Chief Scott, the current um, <coughs> police chief, uh, issued this apology to the queer community on behalf of the SFPD. And it's, um, I weirdly ended up with a job where I work with police officers far more than I would like to. Um, <laughs> And it's just like the, the culture in SFPD doesn't 
seem like it's really changed that much. And like Gerard, you know, there's so many different ways to actually try to repair the harm that's been done over the years. And so, it, you know, I appreciated that October 6 was included in the list of things that, that was being asked for an apology for. But I guess that's my question to the panel. Is an apology sufficient? What would it take to kind of repair the damage that the SFPD has done? Are the relationships between the SFPD and the queer community that much better now? Uh, obviously, they've got more queer people on, or uh, gay and lesbian people on the force, but um, well, openly. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody want to take a crack at that? I'll say one thing. So I'm way out of the loop in terms of any of the questions you're, af you're asking. But that said, I read the newspaper all the time. You know, if the head of the POA is gay, does that mean that the POA is any worse now than it was 20 years ago? I, I think it's just as bad now as it was 20 years ago. It's just got a gay person in charge of it. So I'm, I'm still kind of cynical about the whole thing. Yeah. Again, if anyone wants to learn about it, I hope yeah. you can. I'm just speaking about the POA. <laughs> Thanks, please. I see a hand in the back there. A uh, couple questions. Um, the response you just described uh, from Mayor Agnos, uh, or lack of response, perhaps is a better uh, term. Do you think that played a role in him losing his reelection bid a couple of years later? And then my other question is what leadership or response came from Supervisor Harry Britt? No, oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> Harry do nothing Brit, <laughs> please. I never once saw that man in the Castro ever. I never once saw him at an ACT UP event, at any other kind of event. I never saw him outside of City Hall. I don't think he cared. I don't think he did one thing to try to help us. He didn't even get domestic partners passed. That was done by Matt Coles. So, no, Harry Britt did absolutely nothing to help us. In fact, I wrote a letter, as I said, to each individual person on the Board of Supervisors. The only person who responded was Supervisor Willie Kennedy. Harry Britt didn't even respond. So, no. I don't think that's right. Um, I was at that meeting in Agnes's office, and Harry Britt was there. And he said, my, I remember this really well, that he said ACT UP was doing its job. And you all were way out of line. Now, I'm not saying, you know, necessarily that he followed it with any action, but, and, you know, he didn't respond to your letter, I'm sorry about that, but I don't think it's accurate. He, he was known to stand up for ACT UP at various times during the work that we did. Yes, other questions, comments, or memories, please, Kate. <laughs> um, yeah, I just wanted to add a couple things. Thank you all for, for telling me some things that I didn't know. Um, especially about the follow-up, I, I missed a lot of that. I was one of those people still doing the act of work. But um, I did want to mention one thing that you didn't refer to in terms of, you know, how did we know that this was a planned assault? And one of the things was that I think it was even that night, by the time we got out of jail, that some people that we knew that worked in businesses in the Castro told us that um, there was a cop that was like the local, you know, cool. nice guy, whatever, that would go around, that we felt taking a wig. And he <laughs> went into all these businesses that day on Castro Street and told them, ACT UP is coming into your community tonight to make trouble, and we're going to take care of that. So he was my landlord. <laughs> 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 Um, and the other, the other thing I just wanted to remind people of, thinking, oh shoot, I can't believe I didn't bring that t-shirt, but someone, I think it was Guy Pop No Donut, made the greatest t-shirt that um, it had like red paint splatters and it said, my domestic partner. And domestic partners was kind of a, you know, wedge issue at that moment. Like some of us were not so enamored of the campaign for domestic partnership and didn't necessarily think it was the thing to be focused on. And, so it said, my domestic partner went to the Castro, and all I got was this bloody t-shirt. Yes. <laughs> yes. That was one of the Indeed. Uh, hold on, you do Ruth, and then I see if one went back there. Just really fast, didn't the archives have a shoe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
A different but related demonstration. Frank Jordan, who was the chief of police during during the Castro sweep, but who was at a rubber chicken dinner in Palo Alto. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so he was, oh, I don't know. Uh, but he, when he ran for mayor, it wasn't very well appreciated that he showed up in the Castro during a major protest against the governor vetoing the gay rights bills, the first time it was passed. And uh, activists chased him out of the Castro, and he lost his shoe. <laughs> uh, the shoe is in the archives, and the third of the three annual permit free street parties marking the Castro sweep. What we had was a gigantic Frank Jordan's loafer pinata. <laughs> from the wires of the corner of Castro 18. It was the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence blindfolding people. People got to beat it with a billy club and we had police whistles and condoms if you managed to break them. So Jordan's shoe wasn't at that protest, but the reason he got chased out of here was because he was interested that he was in charge of the cops coming to posture for the votes in Castro. Uh, yes, back to the back. Um, how many people here are aware of the violent, um, the violence of the removal of the pro peaceful protesters of the parade this year? <laughs> it's, uh, it, 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 to me, it's still a very hot topic that has not been addressed. There's not been the police that give very little response to it. And um, the Pride Board, I feel, was in, I've been going to their meetings, um, absolutely. Um, incompetent in how they managed it. And um, it, it leads me to uh, uh, to um, ask the question, like, we're, we're in a time now where it feels to me like uh, there's a target on our back by the government, and I don't see our community coming together. And what do you think it's gonna take for us to start to um, come together as a community again to, um, you know, to start really figuring out how do we stand up to this administration and prepare for what could possibly be down the road. And not just possibly be down the road, but our trans community is at the forefront of being brutalized. And I feel like we're sitting back and really not doing much about it. And, um, Anybody have any observations on this? <laughs> <laughs> it's always hard to get people together. It's always hard. And I think that there will always be people who are doing the work, and people who are fighting the fight, and people who are trying to affect change. Um, but there's always also people who, I mean, a lot of people thought that Martin Luther King was a terrible, awful troublemaker. Um, you know, my mom went to Rikers over the sit-in they did at the New York World's Fair over keeping people of color out of uh, public housing. Um, and uh, you know, we just talked about all the troubles we've had over the years. And I think the question is, who do you want to work with? Find somebody to work with. There's lots of people doing good work. Find, that, find somebody who's doing good work and be part of that work. Try to find out, go, go to your friends, ask who's doing stuff that you really appreciate, that you think is important, and try to network those groups together. Try to, I just, I want to just add, I think you're right, and I just think, I think it's, it's never going to look like it did. Mm -hmm. like, activism is going to look differently today than it did that back then. Right. And, you know, we just, we just gotta, you gotta just, we all just gotta find our place. I mean, if you ask a question that nobody really has an answer to because the world is really such a <laughs> But just, just to kind of follow up on what you're saying, right? Um, I watch everybody on Facebook bitch and moan, but do nothing. So, to, to your point, I hear what you're saying, but you know, to go find groups, and I'm doing that, and I'm meeting people that are actually becoming active, and it's exciting, it feels like I finally have you know, some, some purpose. But getting others to be motivated to realize it, I feel like we're living in the first generation of queer privilege, and people are really taking for granted what rights we have. We were struggling with 
I was just going to say we were just doing the same thing then. Yeah. It wasn't like everybody yeah. was working with us. I, you yeah. know, that's the thing. Like, I don't want people to think that, that ACT UP was some, like, universally beloved. <laughs> like, we were hated for what we did. We were trashed routinely in the papers. Like, they were full of letters to the editor complaining about us. Complaining about October 6th and blaming it on mm -hmm. ACT UP. So it's not, um, which is, is not to say that your concerns aren't real. They are extremely real and valid, just as they were when we were doing this. But it's not as if we had any kind of, you know, I mean, we were a small group struggling to make headway against huge, you know, a, a, the administration and everything else. So um, it, it's, I don't want people to have this kind of nostalgic sort of, you know, view of, of what it was like when we were doing this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, just to support that, I was uh, with my partner, we got pushed into the bar at the top of the hill at the cash drawn market and tried to encourage people to come out. And we got a lot of hostility. Uh, in fact, yeah, someone threw a drink on us, and someone threw a drink back, but anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, we went down to the cast, got pushed down to the cast of theater, and got in. But, you know, I, I, maybe it was because we were women, I don't know. There was, still, there was a lot of sexism, too, then, yeah. so, as there is still. But, you know, it was much more pronounced. And I agree, you know, I think if gay marriage gets repealed, maybe we'll see people in the street or something. Yeah, yeah, you know, the, it's so funny because the last time I was in here, I was doing my laundry. Uh, <laughs> 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 so this used to be the super cruising laundry bag. Yeah, it was a laundry bag, and it was really popular. And um, <laughs> I've lived in the Casper for 45 years, and um, I, I was a little intimidated by all the act up stuff going on during that time. I wasn't really active, but I did admire the, the act, the courage, and the energy. And it's so sad that so many of those people are no longer with us. But um, the point is that the people in this room are, it's the graduate students. This is, we are the leaders now. We are the elder statesmen in the gay community, and it's our job to train the younger generation in the history of what we learn through all this activism. I really think that San Francisco has lost something, and uh, and it's really just a matter of looking in, inside yourself and into your heart and, and fighting for those things that you feel strongly about, because there's a lot going on. Uh, I see a question over here. Um, yeah, I live in Santa Rosa, and I am on the board of directors of the LGBTQ Community Center. Um, it's been around for like 30 years, and we do trainings in the community, um, like LGBTQ cultural humility training. Um, we're going to be doing, we were asked by a lesbian sheriff in the county to do like trainings of the sheriffs. And I'm not personally doing them, but our organization is. Like, I think that's good. I want, I want police force to come to queer people and ask them how they can be better. But I also know that, like, we have mostly young, like, queer and trans people in our organization who are never going to ultimately trust or like the police, like, as an entity itself. And I wonder, like, I guess just. I'd love to hear from the panel on your thoughts about like working to improve police slash also like laying a firm demand that says like no there shouldn't be cops in uniform at the pride event or if there is like other people want other pride events and like those kind of questions like trying to keep keep educating and keep pushing for better treatment by police and an understanding of why there is this long history of distrust. Um, in tandem with like protecting the people who rightly don't feel safe. Yes. Um, while we can were, you use the microphone? Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. While 
while we actually had the lawsuit pending, I helped start a neighborhood organization at 15th and Natoma. Um, we had a 45 minute 911 response time. We had people, it was bad. <coughs> so while I had this lawsuit pending, I was actually part of a neighborhood organization that sat down with members of the Norteños gangs and the local gang task force for that air for the mission area. And that was a little bit surreal and trippy, I have to say. Um, but some of these people, I have to tell you, were really committed to trying to be helpful. And you know, I have family in law enforcement. You know, my one of my uncles was was a New York City police officer for 25 <coughs> years. And so I think sometimes just stepping out of your comfort zone can be really important because it's the individual meetings that can make the biggest difference, I think, with a lot of people. I know that some of the officers that I talked to and that I worked with, with over various, for various reasons over the years were shocked to discover that I had been part of that whole thing, you know? Because <laughs> I seemed so reasonable, you know? And I wasn't at all shrill, and I'm like, well, I've already had, I'm tired, give me a minute. <laughs> Trust me, I can be shrill if I need to, but usually that doesn't work very well. Um, you know, I think ACT UP had a lot of wonderful tactical advantages. And I think you know, it's important to remember that we can be the, you know, the holders of knowledge for the next generation. But I also want to point out that you know, one of the things that made ACT UP work so well, and one of the things that I think is, can be useful in a lot of organizations, is you had a combination of people who had years and years and years of activist training. And you have people who never in their lives before had ever been treated as anything but the apex of civilization that they were. The white upper middle class male. These people, we would sit at a demonstration and then these guys would be like, well, we have rights. And you look at them like, are you crazy? No, we don't. Where have you been? <laughs> oh, right, sorry. Right, you've been in the suburbs where you, they, the, yeah, ah, uh, yeah. But so sometimes just having the opportunity to talk can be enough to remove the image of the boogeyman, you know? Because not everybody in any group is going to be somebody who you really want to take home with you. Let's face it, you know? I mean, there are good people and bad people in every group. Um, I think obviously, you know, I personally feel like maybe this group is, is a little less prone to busting people's heads open than some of the other groups. You know, I admit that bias. Um, but I think that I think that it's a good thing that there will be some training. And remember that you know it isn't just the gray hairs and the lots of experience that can be good. I think that the so, so many of the people in ACT UP, this was their very first foray, and they brought stuff to the table. Mm -hmm. They brought a lot of stuff to the table and an outrage and, and just a, a memory of, you know, for some of us it had been so long since we expected to be treated like human beings mm -hmm. that we forgot. Like, oh, <coughs> right, y'all got, you know, they, you're right, they aren't supposed to do that. Mm -hmm. But you're right, that's, that's illegal. I totally forgot, they've been doing that for so long, I forgot. <laughs> 